Okay, Joseph Agassi, welcome back to the podcast. So, Thank you for having me. Yeah, um, we chatted about a month ago about um, Karl Popper and uh, so much more in your life and your work. And since then, I've sat down and read through some more of your books. So um, Thank you. today, maybe we can chat about um, debate and argument and criticism and, um, and truth and the rules of the game as well. So. And the rules of the game. Uh, so first of all, uh, last time we chatted, you mentioned rabbinical school, I think two or three times. So, and you went to rabbinical school, I think you said. That's so correct. Why is rabbinical school so important in your estimation? Because there are no teachers there. Who sets the curriculum? Uh, I can't say every individual because it's small groups of two or three or four people. And um, how does it play out? You have two or three or four people. And they study a text together at their choice. And how central is debate and argument to all of this? Is it um, the is text it, is... itself is argumentative? The Talmud is a legal text, of so, course, uh, mm. laced with the uh, folklore and whatnot, biblical commentary and so on. But it is basically a legal text. And what what did this give you that you you that you perhaps your peers didn't have in their education? Because this must have helped you somewhere. A sense of relevance. Consider the text of a play, a modern play, without the left side where there is a line for every person for the choice. Suppose you omit from a text of a play, who is talking and when is the discussion taking place. It's something like uh, Japanese theater, kabuki or more so no. You have to know what it's all about. How, how, how close to this environment is it to the original Platonic dialogues or is it completely different? I don't know. I haven't read an original Platonic text, so I can't say. The texts that are published today mm. are very clear about it. They always say who is speaking and more than that. There are certain things even about the Platonic dialogues. For example, they all mention the fact that the symposium is about beauty. I've read nowhere a comment on the fact that the symposium is one of the most beautiful books ever written. That's interesting. What do you make of those, uh, those arguments? Because I read one of your articles, you were talking about debate, and you mentioned Socrates, and you said he falls into this dangerous gap of being a sophist. And, um, and a lot of people think of those old dialogues are simply examples of sophistry. The word sophist has a bad name in Hebrew, in English and Hebrew, which I don't think existed before Plato wrote. Uh, sophist means wise man. And philosopher is a diminution of sophist that Socrates invented. But the main thing is that the sophists served a public and the public expressed their interests. They said what they wanted discussed. Now, this something is yielding too much to the public. Uh, singing to the gallery is a negative expression in the English language. And yet Plato always sang to the gallery. In, in this um, rabbinical school and those Platonic dialogues, um, in, in your reading, is, are there any explicit rules of the game or is it all inexplicit of how you should, should conduct They're all it? implicit. You have to uh, be eased into Talmudic texts. Talmudic texts are really kind of a shorthand presentation of a debate. You have to learn to reconstruct the debate from the text. When you first went to rabbinical school, how, how did you find it? Was it hard? Was it a, a challenge to adapt? Or was, were you first already primed in a way? What's going on? 
Nobody ever told me what is going on in a Talmudic text. I remember I once discovered a small book called the Talmud, which discusses the background to the Talmud and what it's about and so on. And it was for me a relief and a great excitement. I don't know how right the book was, but the very fact that the book addressed a question that is A, ever present, B, hardly ever noted. If debate is so important, which it certainly seems to be, um, why do people find it so, this is a hard question, why do people find it so um, difficult? Why do they find it so unpleasant where this thing is so useful and so important? Imagine chess playing as it happens today, with the exception that when the game is over, the winner uh, thumps his chest and yells a yell of victory. You would say it's a bit crazy, isn't it? So a lot of the problems with debate is the behavior of the winning side. That's correct. And the wish to be on the winning side. That's According it. to the rule of debates, it doesn't matter who wins and who loses. There is a marvelous English expression that I find so marvelous. Let the better men win. Mm. It's sexist and so on, but let's ignore this for now. Sure. Let the better party win. And the expression, it's not who wins, but how you play the game. Do you find that, that that attitude, have you ever really encountered that attitude out there in the world? Because it sounds like an ideal attitude and the kind of things most people tell themselves. And yet when they get in debates, they all want to win. Know. I don't know. Suppose you play chess and you cheat. People would say this is not a chess game. It's another game. By the way, in poker, you are not only allowed to cheat, you are expected to cheat. And the better cheat has a better advantage and so on. Now, the difference between poker and chess is remarkable. Both are games and both are valid, and I have no objection to either. But there's no question that in chess you don't cheat, and in poker you do. That's not to about cheating. And let's, let's, let's talk about a kind of um, the use of rhetoric or, or, or any means possible that's, to win. That's the same. That's the same. Use well, well, of rhetoric is a form of cheating, a gentle form of cheating but cheating it is all the same so what 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 do you make of the court system then because that is a system where it's not let the better man win it's we will fight and we all desperately want to win in in court dialogue plays mm. an important role and the purpose of cross-examination is to make the witness invalidate their own testimony but through the arguments of the two um, sides, both fighting, ad advocating for the truth that they think is on the side, or even if they don't think truth, advocating for it on their side. Doesn't matter, yes. Even though in court, both parties wish to win, mm. uh, it's, by the way, not so in criminal court, it is in civil court like that. There's a fundamental difference between civil and criminal. But we still expect um, truth to be found in the court system, despite we this behavior. Respect is a bit too strong. Let's say hope or wish. Or we, we think it's mm. to win. Or we yeah. imagine it's the best means to do that, perhaps. It's the best means available to us right now. Okay. Yes. Um, on science, then let's talk about science. There's a quote here you put in in one of your papers, and you said. Um, uh, Einstein once said that um, scientific research is a game between the researcher and mother nature. Is that is that a helpful way to see the thing? Yes, that's a quote, of course, yes. But is it a good way to see the game? Because it can lead you down to game Not theory and places like that. The, the innovative part of this quote is what you didn't say, the finish of it. Mm. Uh, it says, nature may say no, it may say maybe, it never says yes. Mm. That's the end of the quote. Yes. Um, let's uh, wind back to um, prehistoric, uh, not prehistoric, but our earlier tribal days and the idea of, of traditions holding within one tribe and then they meet another tribe 
and then traditions clash. Is do, you, do when you think back, do you think this is the predominant way in which um, criticism happens from outside of the tribes we live in, or that's, but, that's how <clears throat> this is a necessary, not a sufficient condition. As you say, clashes of cultures appear again and again, and usually it leads to closure, to avoidance of the clash. The Greeks, under the influence of the Hebrews, I think, uh, made it a rule not to avoid the clashes, but to translate them to civilized manner. Even, oh. mm. even the clashes of knights in the Middle Ages. Now we hold a negative view of the Middle Ages, but we treasure its idea of chivalry. Yeah. Dialectics is either chivalrous or wrong. Um, are we less tribal today? Everywhere you read, you turn on a newspaper, you know, you somehow get there out in the world and you see people tell you how tribal and divided we are. I have a difficulty with what you say because I don't know who your first person plural refers to. Um, the, perhaps I should phrase it slightly differently then. Um, there is a narrative out there that, that keeps popping up. People saying, I mean, I've heard it. I'm not sure if you have, but we hear it on at least certain mainstream news channels. People talk about the tribalization of politics, for example, and people um, stick into their side like a tribe. I have no sympathy with this. Is do you see? Do you believe that we are more tribal today? Because a part of this dialogue is that we've regressed in some. I ways. told you the question is who is the first person plural? Do you think that? Um, um, well, I think to it. You are in Israel. Two processes take place simultaneously. First, more and more people became literate. Secondly, the universities became more and more open. Now, if you take the first person plural to be the whole of the population of the country, then there's no question that the standards rose constantly. Uh, the acquisition of universal literacy is one of the major, major achievements of modern times. People forget that before the modern world, no community was considered literate, not even the Jews. The Jews had special people who read the prayers aloud and the public said, amen, meaning we endorse what you have just said but they couldn't say it because they were not literate. And until now, by tradition, in Jewish synagogues, you have the cantor who prays for the public, but this is now only ritual because now the public, the Hebrew public at least, is literate usually. Well, let me rephrase that question then. Um, how do you view the state of Israeli politics then, if you do follow it? Has that been? There is no Israeli politics. There's no such thing. What is the left? What is left behind then without it? Uh, bickering. Is that, a, is that a form of tribalism? Then? Yes. Hmm. It's not tribalism in the traditional sense of kinship, because all Israelis are kings. Mm. But in the sense of, let's say, Polish Jews differ from Moroccan Jews. The Polish Jews who are in the East are called Western, and the Moroccan Jews who are West are called Eastern. This is a fact about Israel. Mm. And one of the worst fictions in Israel is that every Israeli Jew is either Eastern or Western, whereas most of them are neither. How would you, this is, this is a, a, a off, slightly off the track here. How would you improve Israeli politics? Because it, it seems that the structure is part of the problem within. Oh, oh, by normalizing Israel. What do you mean by normalizing Israel? You mean removing the, the normal, religious? In normal countries ever since the French Revolution, citizenship and nationality are equal and religion is out of the equation. In Israel, it's not that way. And that would improve the, the political situation? That would make Israel able to do politics. I say there's no mm. politics, only politicking. Another tricky sidetrack. Do you, do you see that move ever happening, that, that, that removal? 
No, I'm very pessimistic. Why do, why, why do you think that move wouldn't happen? Because I, I can imagine why the original, I, it's easy to imagine the, the original reason for making a Jewish state. I don't know, but I'll give you an example. Political debates on television in Israel happen every night. And every night, as soon as the debate comes to the point, it ceases and its cessation has always the same expression. Everybody shouting. I lived in India once and it was exactly the same. Um, so I, 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 I can picture it. Yeah, looks more frustrating than it looks fun. Um, That's right. um, on a, a, back to the, the core things, is there ever a, a time where we should avoid debate? I don't mean simply because we don't have the energy, but are some debates simply not worth having? Oh, it's very simple. Uh, uh, when you are in a surrounded unit, you can have debates amongst its members what to do. But at a certain moment, either imposed from outside or from the inside, debate is over, somebody takes command, it may be the lieutenant, it may be the sergeant, but somebody takes command and they go out into the open having no idea where they are going to, but they simply need to get out of where they were. Is that a deferral of the debate for instance, for a later point? Or is that this a... is a situation where the debate has to stop. They have to even not to start. But does it, it, mm, does it restart at a, at, a, at a later date or is it simply there's no it place within the military at all? In, in the military, always, there is no debate, but there is a court martial. Does this make militaries uh, stronger or less strong? Because a lot of the... No, that, that is... Essential in the military, you have to follow the command, and if you survive whatever happened next, then you can go to court martial. How do you balance the, the lack of criticism then? Because surely that lack of criticism will bring errors. I mean, a lot of people look at the war in Ukraine right now and think one of the errors that happened on the Russian side is no one was yeah. willing to have criticism. I don't know. Let me contrast, contrast here in the Israeli army, there's a rule the if of an action requires of the commander of the action to listen to criticism of the underlings, the first rank be below the commander. They don't have to accept it, but they have to listen. That I think makes Israel the strongest army possible, excuse me. The commander has to listen to criticism, not to accept it, but to listen to it, the eve of the action. Mm. Yeah. I find this a marvelous thing. Is, is there not a danger in repressing criticism like this then? Because it tends to bubble back up. It's at some always point. dangerous to repress criticism, but at times it is unavoidable. Have you followed the debate in America at the moment with um, abortion now coming back on the radar in America? Why and does the debate come? I'm assuming before? because it was... Um, it was solved by the Supreme Court rather than the by Congress. So there was an, a, at least a belief on one side that it was suppressed, the debate, and then it rumbles on for another 30, 40 years, 50 years. How did the debate on abortion come to for to begin with? Uh, in the very first stage, I'm not sure. Yeah. By Jewish law, by the way, mm. fetuses have no status. Yes. So according to Jewish law, you can perform abortion any day until the day of the birth. And moreover, when there is a danger of a woman dying in birth, which happens repeatedly, my maternal grandmother died in giving birth. So it's, it was not something out of the ordinary then according to the law, they should have prevented the birth, but the law was not uh, applied. Stick on, um, on the question of family then. Um, how important is debate within marriage? Because you wrote about this and you say useful debates make stable marriages and most people don't think this before they get married. Yes, that's right. 
first of all, the lack of respect for women prevents debate between male and female, quite generally, nothing to do with marriage in particular, which I find unacceptable. In Jewish prayer book, it says, thank God who has not made me woman. And this has to be cut out of the prayer book. You see, if there is one thing that everybody knows is that only women can have children, not men. And in all cultures, they say the opposite. Is there some um, um, very important um, element about letting people choose? So I know one of the feelings in America was that, at least on the conservative side, that we didn't get the choice. We didn't get to make the decision. It was made by the constitution and um, at least the interpretation of the, of the constitution. How important- this is, what, this is what the women's movement says all the time, mm. that women have the control over their own bodies. This is the major argument for abortion. <clears throat> so if debate, as you mentioned earlier, is such a hard thing to do and it, it fails so often, based largely on the behavior of the winners. Why do people have such high hopes of debate? Is it a psychological thing? No, debate is the only mean we have for getting the truth. And we don't want to lose hope of achieving the truth. The, you, you, you must have bumped into many people over the years though, that hate the thought of confrontation and debate. They hate the idea of, of, of just being engaged in such things. That's right, because they wish to be led by the word of God. And so they choose as their own guides, people who have direct access to the de deity. The Pope is supposed, not regularly, but at ex cathedra, that you say the Pope as a Pope has direct access to the divine. This is a Catholic ideal, which I find abhorrent. Mm. I find the very idea of Catholicism awful. I mean, never mind right or wrong, just think of it seriously. Bertrand Russell, Marriage and Morals, begins with a marvelous opening. He says, there is no sex ethics, there is ethics applied to sex. That's first of all. Secondly, he said, the question is, what do you prefer? Being told by the Pope every time how to behave and to be always right, or to do your own thing and make your mistakes and pay for them. I think this is marvelous. I can't tell you how much I admire Bertrand Russell. Mm. Um, can you coerce people into, into debate? In a way, I mean that, that's a counterintuitive point, but can we? Should we encourage people into this? I encourage is a bit weak because encourage you simply encourage is good enough. I think yes. I think the truth is that we discourage children from debating with the teachers because the teacher is right and they are wrong. And if you just gave me a few minutes more, I'm sorry. I, 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 <laughs> Um, let's talk about some, some, you know, I was coming to the, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, I find it so regularly amongst my peers. It always makes me laugh. Uh, if you only, yeah. <laughs> well, on that, on, on that frustration, then how much of the failure of debate is simply a frustration that we expect too much of this? The quote you had in one of your articles expect was too much because we expect instructions. See, there is a, a Jewish text, a late one, 17th century or so, called Laid Table. And it begins by saying, the moment you open your eyes, now that's enough. <laughs> the mm. moment you open your eyes, <laughs> you know, before you come to yourself, you are already under chains. <laughs> You had a quote here. You say, we, we, we get stuck in traffic jams and we are frustrated and we blame the traffic. Um, 
So is this one of the problems that we get stuck in debates and we get frustrated and we blame debates or we blame criticism in general rather than blaming the poor? This is our education. You see, the teacher wants you to listen to him because you are a kid and he's adult and he forgets that soon he will be adult. And then what? Janusz Korczak says that if you want education for democracy, you should be democratic right here and now. And that, I think, is the last word. What about poetry and debate about poetry? You wrote this here and you say most people take for granted the idea that there's no skill needed for poetry. Um, and all the great poets are born here. And this removes all of the, the criticism and the debate around what a good poem is or a good poet is. Um, how do you see this? People should know that writing poems is very easy. Writing good poems is very difficult. That's all. It's a slight confusion. When people say poems, they mean good poems. When people say art, they mean good art. And that's a verbal habit which should be altered. I'm going People to ask should you. never confuse art and good art. Yes. I'm going to ask you about art in just a section. In just a section, actually. Um, uh, this, um, there's, there's another point here. How should we, you know, for very young people, you put in here somewhere that this is not a good way to do it, which is um, you're, you're, you're playing chess against a very young person and you take a couple of pieces off your board yeah. or your, or th this, this, this type of behavior, handicapping yourself so that they get a leg up. And you write That's that right. this is not a good structure for That's education. Correct. Why is that? Because People who play against uh, seniors who take a uh, uh, piece out play a different game and it destroys the sense of the game for a long time. It's just deception. Is there not a risk that they'll struggle so badly in the earlier stages if, if you don't handicap yourself, that they won't find critics, they won't find the enjoyment in the game because it's too difficult? First of all, whether they enjoy the game or not is a very specific item to be examined specifically. There are no general rules about it. It's a fact that many of the great chess players are infant prodigies, which is the same as with playing the piano. The infant prodigies have a great advantage of avoiding school. So we should make school less harmful. You see, all normal children are mathematical geniuses. They learn to count alone. They learn to count by twos, by fives, by tens alone. They learn some addition, subtraction, and even a little multiplication. One plus one equals two kills them. Now the question is why? Why is one plus one equals two so bad? The answer is that the kids don't know what's going on and even the teacher don't know. One plus one equals two is a part of a, can you finish the sentence? One plus one equals two is a part of a? I have no idea. I have no table. idea where you go. The answer hmm? is table. Okay. Can you continue the table? One plus one equals two. Continue. I, I fear I'm going to start making mistakes here, but... Um, yeah, make a mistake. Come on. Two plus two. Three plus three. Four That's plus not four. Bad, not bad. The right thing is different, but... It, what is the right is thing? This is one table. The first table is one plus one equals two. One plus two equals three. And the next table is one plus one equals two. Two plus one equals three. Mm -hmm. Three plus one equals four. So there are two tables before the table you mentioned, but you are all right. You gave me a table, which is more than most people do when I ask them this. People don't know what's a table. Neither teacher nor student know what tables are. The first tables that people get aware of used to be logarithm tables. Now even that is gone because you have the computer. You have not studied logarithm table, did you? Um, I may have. Um, I have I to. Have, if I have, I've certainly forgotten it, yeah. 
Exactly. I, I studied logarithm tables, how to use them. But people, my students don't know what logarithm tables are. They don't use them. There are other tables like J function. Do you know what's a J function now? I'm well out of my depth now. No. This is not a mathematics course. I just <laughs> mentioned this to tell you there are many mathematics tables. Yeah. And nowadays we don't need any of them because the computer can give us the alternative much quicker. So why the consistent failure to do this then? Why are we not teaching these because things? Because our school system teaches mathematics with the use of tables without telling kids what tables are because the teachers don't know what tables are. This is a gap in our system. There is worse than that. When you teach a kid one plus one equals two, you start with the inductive method, which is a terrible thing. They say one match plus one. I don't know why, but this is <laughs> it. One match plus one match equals two matches. Yeah. One apple plus one apple equals two apples. One pair plus one pair equals two pairs. Danny, how much is one plus two? Uh, now, Danny is the best student in the class. And when he's asked one plus one equals two, he knows the answer. He knows that he's expected to say two, but he doesn't know why. The teacher doesn't know how. Mm. So he cannot express himself as clearly as we do now. He says, uh, that's the best he can do. And he was shown because he was the best. So teacher says, Danny, apple plus apple is two apples. One pair plus one pair equals two pairs. One plus one. Uh, the kid knows that the answer is two, and he refused to give it. And the teacher thinks that he doesn't know the answer. And there is here a cross purpose. Now, this story is not my invention. I've seen it regularly going to elementary schools. I went to elementary schools. Please don't misunderstand me. Mm. And I've seen it happen. And it is the best arithmetic student in class who is the victim, and he then goes to study arts. So that, I was about to ask you, what's the effect of this on the student? And that is they abandon mathematics. He goes to, no, he goes to study arts. Mm. Now in arts, the same thing happens. <laughs> <laughs> if you take any violin teacher, you know, the violin teacher wants the student to play a tone and he doesn't, he gives you a certain screech. Yeah. And, and, the, and the teacher cringes when he hears the screech. And that's the end of the course. What happens the rest is from bad to worse. I imagine a lot of the behavior that happens in the, in, in the departments that make those decisions and pose those criteria is a, a lot of compromise happening. So at some point, no, at least no, they believe no, what, they're compromising in some No, point. what happens in departments is very simple. We want mathematicians. We know that the mathematicians are no more than 1% of the population. So we need a filter. Filtering is one of the commonest phenomena on the east. You know what's strychnine? Strychnine? Yeah, you know I've, what it is. I've heard the name, but um, it's no. It's poison. Yeah. It's a poison. You know how it kills you? No. It connects all the synapses. You know what's a synapse? Yeah. When it connects all the synapses, you have overload of information. And you start twitching. So you um and you die from over information. Is it over information or is it just simply yeah. a, a hyperactivity? No. Say it again. Is it, I mean the fire of the synapses, are we assuming that that's that, 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 that simply that's, information, information happening? Of course, that is information. The, the linkage of the synapses and passing information to the brain. Not only that, your eye sends the brain much too much information. Yeah. So the eyes don't connect to the brain, they connect to a gland called genicula. Mm -hmm. The genicula receives enormous amount of information and transfers to the brain a slight amount of information which suffices for us to see everything. Not only that, you know, we all remember, for example, stories turns out to be a mistake. We don't remember the story. We remember 
junctions and reconstruct the stories. So Most it, of what we think is memory is reconstruction. But the filter is 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 our mind applying a filter at some point. At some point, yes. uh, at the, all those our, our you know the eyes were sending us all that information, and it was yes. overwhelming. And surely, yes. a, a, we create theories in our mind to filter out a lot of this stuff. Yeah, it's not only that. You know, when you sit in the cinema, on the side, you see the pictures as very thin. You know, people become as thin as uh, mm. matches, and very quickly you forget it, and they get the volume necessary. Your, the eye translates every picture. Can you imagine you have 24 per second in the mm. cinema and the eye translates every picture. On that, you wrote a wonderful article about brainwashing. And yeah. I know this seems like, and one of the examples you had was, was, was in a cinema where they flick in little images to make you yes, buy popcorn. Subliminal. subliminal. Yes. yes. And it does work at, to a point, you said. And then exactly. you get. And then people uh, uh, change their homeostat. Yes. They notice that they're buying more popcorn and they change. So you can't trick people through this, this hypnosis can, or but things only like temporarily. this. Temporarily. Yes. Is. Um, is indoctrination the same thing as brainwashing, or are they different? Very different, of course. Indoctrination is done openly and violently. Brainwashing is done deceptively. How much of the stigma that around, um, everyone says brainwashing and, and it is a dirty word. And I'm assuming how much of this goes back to the old communist show trials where we first start to pay attention the to communist these show trials it's not clear whether or to what extent there was the brainwashing. Somewhere, somewhere, not, I think, but I don't know. I mean, the major authority is Weizberg Cibulski and he is unreliable. So I don't know. Have you read Weizberg Cibulski? No. Very interesting book about the show trials. I have read a lot about the Korean War and I know at the end of the Korean War, this is where a lot of the, um, this is when the this movie, The Manchurian Candidate comes from as well. And yes, um, right. it's a very great movie, but it's, uh, yes. its theory is wrong, of course. Mm. So you wrote here, and this is interesting, that one of the failures that was made through those soldiers who changed their minds and, and became communists was simply the American side not being able to, to imagine that a free thinking American could ever choose communism, which is. Um, That's right. That was a great mistake, yes. So does brainwashing require force? Because you wrote about torture. And if you torture people, it's very hard to brainwash them if you are torturing them and force them in that way. On the contrary, it creates opposition, hostility. The brainwashing has a major means of deception of confusing enemy with friend. Your interrogator, who is your enemy, manages to make you feel friendly towards him. That's the major thing. Is See, in the Israeli army, there was a time where people were interested in brainwashing very much. I, I used to lecture in the Israeli army, and there were three major topics that people wanted. One of them was brainwashing. There must be people listening who think, and I was, I, I used to think this before reading your article, yeah. actually, that brainwashing is not a real thing. That, you know, we're, we're talking to it to each other. If I change my mind, then Agassiz has, has brainwashed me in a way, because no. we're always influenced no. by each other. We are always influenced by each other with respect. We respect each other's autonomy. Mm. Unlike a teacher, I don't talk down to you. Mm. And unlike a teacher, you don't talk down to me. So there is no possibility here of misunderstanding or deception or anything like that. Whereas in brainwashing, the brainwasher manages to confuse the captive to think that he's a friend. You mentioned in your, the first step and this is softening. What's, what does softening look like? Oh, uh, uh, not letting you uh, wash, for example. Making you eat dirty food, for example. 
this then is the, soft. the next step is is the interesting one and you say it's very similar to kafka's trial where um they they don't tell you what they want from you they don't tell you what they're trying to convince you of you're being accused of something but it's no specific crime why is this important you are accused of concealment of something unspecific yeah and that makes you quite naturally uh, tell your life story because you don't know what they want to hear from you when you've told your life story once once you get into this you go on and say this is where most confessions come from start telling your life story and you're going to start okay. soon and start giving it up yes because when you tell your life story truthfully you also confess some guilt everyone has some guilt and then they cling to the guilt and say you see you are guilty by your own verdict shame on you and the word shame is of course the important word how important in in this brainwashing technique is is the um the role of the um the surreptitious um cellmate the person i say that's all this is all there is to it nothing more mm. i say as long as you remember that he is the enemy you will not be brainwashed which is why the next step is so important would they send in after that softening and after that guilt you write um an intelligent human being who comes in with a different attitude and wants to talk to you in a in a civilized way and suddenly exactly. you cling to this person cuz you you cling to the civilized debate and you cling to them as a friend cuz they're so much different to everything else that's come before that's true and that for me is the importance of brainwashing it shows that even people who don't know what debate is know the difference between decent and deceptive debate the talmud makes a lot of it it says the debate has to be for the sake of heaven mainly for the sake of truth i hope that's mm. clear yeah it says any debate that is not for the sake of heaven is doomed to failure and the talmud is a debate system and it constantly reminds you that it's for the sake of heaven that you say let the better party win whether it's me or you doesn't make a difference there's an and once mm. you once you absorb this the idea that me or you doesn't matter means that you and i are one and this is a mystic experience this is the most exciting thing one can ever look to there's um another point here which i thought was really interesting where the jailer tells the person being brainwashed that they're short on time the 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 prisoner has all the time in the world but I'm short on time so that they by that they subtly control when the debate starts and when the debate ends which is the only yeah. thing in their life and by and this little rule lie. Mm. And, yeah and that is the lie that makes them win because they can win or not win whereas the other party can lose or not lose mm. that it, is the lie so for people out there who get captured and uh someone's trying to brainwash them you uh, how you 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 said re just remember the person talking to you is always your enemy and exactly. perhaps tell fake stories when you start telling tell me your life story tell a fake i guess yeah sure tell the neighbor's story yes yeah. i want wanted to write a novel about a fellow who was brainwashed and pretended to be the neighbor and we discovered that the neighbor was a killer <laughs> um I, I, just before we leave brainwashing because it is so interesting yeah. once the person you say so those subtle hypnosis and those subtle things in the cinema they wash away once you realize what's happened to you once exactly. the brainwashing ends i'm assuming the brainwashing washes away too you 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 you, you don't that stay is the, that is the fact in america the wisest thing the psychologist could say is leave the brainwashed alone let them change in their own time is that the idea they, they will get out of it yes mm. i hope you're enjoying the podcast so far and i apologize for this brief interruption but i will take this moment to briefly send out a plug for the podcast itself the popperian podcast is something that i've been planning for quite a while and it's something that i want to keep running month to month but to do so it's going to need your help if you're willing or able or interested 
please go to the links below the podcast and support us however you can. It will be your help as listeners that keeps the podcast going and keeps the content coming out. And I thank you in advance. And with that said, we will now return to the second half of the interview. Thanks for listening. Bernard Shaw, you've got a quote from Bernard Shaw in here. And you say, the reasonable man, he says, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. Yeah. The unreasonable one persists trying to adapt the world to, him, to himself. Therefore, all progress for, uh, depends on the unreasonable man. It, what's wrong with that? Is, is, or is that a real thing? Because you imagine that this oh, is the I unreasonable. Think he's right. No, no, no. I think so is right. Are the unreasonable what? person is unreasonable by received standards. The next generation take the reasoning as the right reasoning. But that's change. That's progress. Aren't we all unreasonable in a way? Or does he mean some, some deep dogmatist when Shaw is talking like this? No, no, he means most people are dogmatic, which I think is true. Not uh, firmly dogmatic, but dogmatic as a default option. You see, kids believe in everything. They grow up and believe, learn that there is no Santa Claus, and then they become cynical and we believe nothing. And then they go back to normal and believe everything more or less. And usually there, it stops. Only very few remain skeptical for the rest of their lives. It is strange to say, but most people believe that skepticism is an impossible position. People say, you are not a skeptic, even if you declare yourself because you act. And since you act, it proves that you are not a skeptic. This puzzles me greatly because, as I told you, a unit under siege acts certainly with no certitude, but they act. So the idea that you can't act unless you are certain is a stupid idea that most philosophers of science take for granted. Why do people become dogmatic? You, uh, there's a quote here from Francis Bacon, and I thought this was good. And you say, uh, he says, the idea uh, that dogmatism is a kind of self-flattering. Is it that is we, we, when we're dogmatists, it, it, you know, it coddles our ego in a certain way that we are right. Is that the reason? I'm not or? sure. It's a, it's a good hypothesis, but I don't know. I found that, for example, fanatics don't flatter themselves. The op- are they the opposite? Yeah. Do they hypercritical? Because that, that seems to me a, a problem of a kind as well, if you're too some tolerant of error. Are, some fanatics are hypercritical, that is correct. I knew a student who was a communist, and one day he became a Hasidic follower of a rabbi. And I found it amusing. He didn't care what he believed in, but he needed to believe firmly in something. So for some people, it is true, but for most people, not. Most people hardly care what they believe about. The fact that in the United States, many people who migrate change church because of their migration. How do you deal with that kind of um, ambivalence? Then, because that must be very difficult to have a debate or an argument with someone who, who seems um, ambivalent towards truth. You see, you are asking a question that appears regularly and always puzzles me. You don't have to argue with anybody except for the police and the court. What about a public debate of a kind? It's a lot harder to walk away from a public debate. In... First of all, public debate is a very rare phenomenon. Both you and the public have to agree. For example, I used to partake in public debates. For decades now, nobody invites me. Did you feel that pressure that it was hard to walk away in a, in a, in a public debate, even if you recognize the other side are dogmatic never, or? Never, never. I, I always play. I always play. You see, my sense of game is so strong that I don't care. So how, I'll, I'll ask you about that. 
why why is that I, that that deep joy you, I'm, so, I'm i'm assuming you enjoyed the game even if you recognize the other side was being dishonest or playing a different game of a kind you could recognize that is that something Not only that i recognize it before he does <laughs> <laughs> But that must be rare though. I'm assuming that you, you don't encounter too many people like that out there. I mean, I, I, I really enjoy it as well, but I, 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 it, it seems that that must be a rarity. When you encounter someone in a debate and you realize that they're using rhetoric and they're dogmatic and they're lying, it can be, yeah. you realize that they're breaking the rules of the debate in a way, and it's hard so, to stick around. Let, let, let me report to you. My teacher, Karl Popper, was an extremely frustrated person for the simple reason that many of the burning questions he had ready-made answers and nobody listened to him. And I learned from him not to be frustrated. That's the one thing I learned from him. But it doesn't stop me from regretting not being consulted. I used to appear on television in Israel regularly and they don't invite me now for any course, they won't. Even when they know that I'm the best expert in the field, they won't. You see, there are in universities, uh, very few departments of philosophy and history of science. And I've been invited to all of them except for the one in Tel Aviv. So why, why has this happened to you, do you think? Because they prefer to win than to learn from me. Is that this personally is, is that personally frustrating for you? Because that's what it I mean by walk away. It is hard to walk away. It it grieves me. It doesn't frustrate mm. me in the sense that they sit and say, why don't they? But it's but, it's a pity. I could you see, I'm a very good teacher and I have almost no students. This is uh, sad. Mm. I'm wasted. Well, you have the books. I've been reading them recently. They are, they so in a way yeah. you have, you know. But even here, you see, when you have 100 publications, it's a lot. And I have 600. And I'm tired of writing another paper. It becomes not enough of a challenge for me. Well, you brought it up. So let's talk about peer yes. review briefly. What's wrong with peer review as a process? Because you wrote another paper, very critical of the whole process. Um, so oh, it's, it's mutual back scratching. Always or most of the time? Oh, it didn't used to be like that. It became like that when it became institutionalized. You see, if you if you want to support a colleague, you ask a friend of his to recommend him. If you want to block him, you ask an enemy of his to recommend him. These are well-known things. And that means that peer review is nulled. Have you ever been on the editorial board of a peer review paper before? Oh, yes, I've been many times. What, did you see from the inside that there was a better way to do the process? Because it's not so straightforward of how to clean it up, as opposed to get the egos out of the room and, and, and the gatekeepers. All, no, the idea of peer review is let the better scholar be a professor. Again, let the better scholar be a professor. I question this. We don't know who is the better scholar. There are different criteria. Since I was anti-analytic philosopher all my life, before I met Popper, uh, all roads were close to me. You see, I'm a, I have a successful career. I'm finished with my career for decades now, so I can look back at it. It was a success, but I never had any surprise. I moved from one step to the next step, always one step at a time, fighting for each move, fighting for each move. It's really bothering, uh, boring. Is there no satisfaction in the fight? I imagine those professors who are handed, handed gifts along the way it can't be no, fun. The no, fight, fight has fun. some excitement, does it not? You see, here I'm really all on the side of chivalry. It's fun when you meet an opponent who knows the rules of the game, 
and who is slightly adept at it, not much, but enough to make it again. See, I'm a fencer. And it amazed me that the rules of fencing, fencing and the rules of the Talmud are the same. This is so marvelous. Yes. You see, in fencing, you never say, I hit. You say, I didn't hit, or I say, you hit. So it is an, it, 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 it's a gentleman's honor. You have to, I mean, but I assume- you said, you said the right word. I had to assume, though, part of that involves when you find a cheat in fencing, there must have been some of the year, that that person is treated incredibly harshly. I, I don't know anything about the sport. But if you find- refuse to play with him, that's all, no. So he's he's basically no harshness. They're just they're just refusing. That's a is a kind of harshness in the sense of he's removed from the entire game. Then isn't he? No, he's he can't no, play. He's, he, he's put in a certain place in the arena, a place which I would not go to. In in it's argument, like a cheater in gay in chess. There are people who cheat in chess. Yes. They are stupid, but they exist. In argument and debate, and this is going to touch on Popper slightly, uh, how important is 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 does the question matter? Getting the right, the getting the question right. You 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 say we should stop asking things like what is the essence of a thing or something like that. How damaging is it that most people start with bad questions when they want to argue about something? I would say most arguments are on bad questions, such as what is the right religion or something like that. There's more than that in economics, they tell you that every expenditure that is a once only doesn't count unless it creates bankruptcy. Mm. And people don't know this rule. And they are wasting a lot of time and effort. I think, for example, that everyone can become rich. And that most people tell you that they want to be rich, but it's not true. If you ask them more carefully, they admit that they want to be rich, but, for example, I tell them, you want to be rich, would you rob a bank? Most people would say no, for one reason or another, doesn't matter, but they'd say no. If you really want to be rich, you would rob a bank. You know the story, they asked, what's his name? Why, why, did you rob, why do you rob banks? No. no? Says, because that's where the money is. No. Dillinger. It was. Oh, Dillinger. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Because um, that's what funny. This is such a marvelous joke because he changed the question, the meaning of the question. When he, they, he asked, why do you rob banks? They meant, why not be a worker or a clerk rather than a bank robber? Yeah. Whereas he asked, what should I rob? And the answer is money. <laughs> um, how, what, how much of the error in a lot of the arguments we have are people just um, um, having conceptions that are either truly true or truly false? One of the ones you put here is people are sinners. And people always debate things like this, people are sinners. And of course, the, the, the content doesn't exist a lot beforehand. Of course, it's true. And of course, it's not true. And um, how, how, how much is it people simply can't, don't know what they want to argue before they start to argue? The idea that argument is hostile is self-fulfilling because they only allow argument in when they are forced to. And then they lose, of course, the old sense of argument that it is out of free will, that is an expression of free will. So there is a distortion from the start. Should we but start? Should, yeah, please go. People should learn to argue the way they play chess. And this most teachers find intolerable, what I've just said. Should we, um, is there any value in trying to seek definitions or we've fallen into Wittgenstein's little game here? It depends. In some cases, you have to discuss definitions, for example, if you're a lawyer. There's no question about it. What do you make of it? We spoke a lot about a lot of philosophers last time we spoke, but we didn't bring up Wittgenstein much, at least not as a direct discussion. I what think he doesn't count. Why not? Because he's a positivist. 
I know positivism is very popular, but it doesn't count. What about um, if you leave some of that behind? What about at, at least his um, uh, the idea that um, we 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 can rescue debates simply by having a clearer understanding of what we're talking about? So, and we can realize then that there's no debate at all. Uh, this I think is asinine. For example, suppose I told you all novels are stupid. I would be 90% right and therefore dead wrong. Dead wrong, not just wrong. Because it's a good novel that count. So when we need more clarity, instead of instead of pushing towards there being no debate. First of all, the concept of clarity that Wittgenstein had is asinine. Mm. The concept of uh, Solomon Maimon is right. And people forget Solomon Maimon, what can I say? He died in the year 1800, long before Wittgenstein. Mm. And he got it right. I think it was Popper who said, instead of seeking clarity, we should... Um, um, well, get clarity by by um, restating the argument better, or restating the dispute better, or more, or in a different way. And that doesn't clean up the debate; it just targets. I think it. Popper is technically right. If you want to go beyond it and say why is he right, I'd say you have to go to Solomon Maimon. Um, what happened to the followers of Wittgenstein over the years? Because I know they 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 made great efforts to try and. Exist. They don't exist. Not anymore, but I'm sure when you were... I never uh, did. I, when I wrote my book on Wittgenstein, I served the whole literature. It was very painful and boring to the extreme. I found that the people considered most competent were incompetent. The whole literature on Wittgenstein is appallingly substandard. So what did people find so captivating about him then? Because they people did find him captivating. It's a marvelous question. First of all, every time somebody comes with a promise to solve a very difficult question with a very simple manner. Mm. My metaphor is always people holding a ram in order to break the gate to a walled city. And you come to them and say, the ram is too much. I have a key. And they say, look, our ram is so big and it doesn't work. Your key should work. It's a little thing, the key. And he said, yes, my key will do what your ram doesn't. That's the answer to Wittgenstein, to the whole of the problems that he raised. The solutions are easy and obvious and so on. And he made a big deal out of really nothing. He wanted absolute clarity, which doesn't exist. And this is what Solomon Maimon proved. So was, was, he, was, was he claiming um, um, uh, a criteria for clarity and simply using common yes. sense? Yes, yes, he was claiming a criteria. You should ask me, what is it? Yeah, what is it? He never said. Some of his he followers. Was a liar. Mm, mm. He was a liar, a downright simply liar. His philosophy is, has, has somehow captivated, not just at the time, he but said, somehow it's now in popular ideas. He and, said, The only thing I want to be remembered as is the man who said there are no philosophical problems. He said, and I'm quoting, quote, mm. To ask a philosophical question is sick, end of quote. So are we stuck with vagueness then? I, I'm sure that people listen to this and think to themselves, the well, it, must yes. we embrace vagueness then? Embrace not. You don't embrace illness, although you know that you have to live with it. What do you mean by embrace? And we shouldn't seek criteria, even if it's just I never got there? There are criteria. They are only too high. I can tell you the criteria now. You didn't ask me. I didn't say, but I can tell you. Please, yeah. In artificial languages, the problem doesn't exist because in artificial languages, there's a clear cut division 
between descriptive and formative words. And I'll tell you what it means. The descriptive word can change. If you say all men are mortal, you can say instead of all men, all goats, because both men and goats are descriptive. But if you change all to some, then it's a different sentence form altogether. When you change the formative words, you change the sentence. The sentence form is recognized by its formative words. So you must know the difference between formal words and descriptive words. This does not hold for living languages. So you cannot do logic in a living language. When you do logic, you formalize the part of language that you discuss. This is a simple fact. This is um, a slight side note, but I picked it up a while ago, an article of yours, which is about language. Um, and it's called, um, can adults become truly bilingual? So is it, you know, is, is must, it possible? I must compliment you. You mentioned things of mine that nobody ever mentioned to me. I've been trolling through your archives the last month or so. You are doing, you are doing exceptional work and I compliment you for it. So is it possible to be bilingual, truly bilingual, not just be able to speak the language, but actually bilingual then? I mean, I've, I am I'm, bi I, I'm bilingual, of course. Do you consider yourself truly bilingual? Uh, truly is a bit too strong because I never lost my accent. You must hear me and notice that my accent is foreign. So I don't notice it when I speak to you, but do you notice really? a barrier? No, no, I notice your accent, but I, I don't notice a, 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 um, um, a language barrier. But from your end, is there ever a, a noticing of a language barrier? No, no, I'm proficient in English more than many native English people. What, what about the use of idioms and things like this? Because these are one of the oh, huge yes, challenges. Yes. I used idioms as well as any uh, English speaker, born English speaker is, yes. And because there's no... I studied English literature and poetry. Mm. I can give a lecture on English poetry any day. There's no cultural... I can give a lecture on T.S. Eliot any day. Mm. It is no small matter. <laughs> so there's an argument, and I think I found it in one of your articles, where it is people will say no matter how fluent you become in a second language, you're always going to be using your first language to explain or to construct the second, and you're always going to be working backwards. Is, is, is this not the case when you when for yourself? I don't know. I don't know. I take, for example, a simple criterion, dreaming. Yes. Do I dream in Hebrew or in English? I'm assuming and both I, at the same time. The same both, no, it de de depends on what dream is. I told Watkins, when I dream of having a debate with him, it's in English. And he said, you dream. <laughs> he was appalled by the very idea that I could <laughs> dream about in a, a debate with him. He was a terrific person. Um, I, I, I have to assume that one of the problems with seeking definitions is that as a type of essentialism, and this is pop, this is coming back to Popper a bit here. That it, it's you see, this is an essentialist statement. When Popper says essentially, essential definitions are, he gives an essential definition. So, how does he get away with it? Or is it, or is it one of those things? Yeah, he didn't notice it, and this is a minor matter. All these. All problems of definition can be easily settled. I don't mean that they are not genuine problems. They are genuine problems, but they are easily settleable. There's an argument here, um, and you say um, debates about factual questions. I think this is Popper, and he says we should try and have we should try and find an answer that reduces the strangeness of the world. Is this... No, no, that's not proper. That's Abraham Maidan, a former student of mine. Mm. Is, is that something that we should be trying to do? Because that sounds to me a vague kind of thing to reduce the strange. Or is this equatable to Popper's simplicity or something like that? Yes, it is. And it is meant to be vague. Like simplicity also is vague. Mm. Popper gave a definition of simplicity in his logic reforcing, which is magnificent, of course, but still it's only reduces the problem, doesn't 
completely remove it. What about hmm. What about people that make ad hoc changes to to their arguments and their theories? Because this seems to me a perfectly natural thing to do, but of course it, it leads um, to a place which, which is perhaps unwelcome. We tend not to believe anything people say if they've made too many ad hoc changes to their theory. Well, you're marvelous. You see, you reach the point. You ask about beliefs. Everybody knows what is a belief. Only stupid people like me say, I don't know what you're talking about. People assume that belief is as obvious as possible because it's rock bottom. When debates took place in the 17th and 18th century, the enemy was always the idealist, the one who denies the existence of the real world. And so they struggled with beliefs, right beliefs, wrong beliefs, and so on. I find all this redundant. I never talk about beliefs in any of my papers. I discuss opinions. And if I don't know which opinion is right, I go both ways. It's not inconsistent to say there are two ways, try both. What do you, these are a little bit connected though, but what's the, what is the, the differences here and the challenges involved in predicting and explaining? I know once you explain something, predictions often follow and do follow, but I predict, you wrote that um, predictions are, are much more challenging things to come about. And every, every person with a conspiracy theory has an explanation of a sort. They just don't have a prediction of something that's gonna happen. The conspiracy theory is so attractive because it's on the border between magic and science. It has them both. That's marvelous. Are there any conspiracy theories that you've ever entertained throughout your life? It's ridiculous. You see, the conspiracy theories always assume that good things and bad things occur because of good and bad intentions. Mm. It's magic. What Papa says about it is the last word. He says there are certain unintended consequences, and that's it. This is already Hayek, of course, but yes. Mm. Um, that's, is it worth debating meaning? This is a little bit back to Wittgenstein and, and the positive vis again as well. Is it worth having debates about meaning or these? Never, never, because if you have two alternatives and they are both signified, you repeat the debate twice. If you have three meanings that signify, repeat the debate three times. What's the big deal? Mm. There are a couple of debates that seem to run around the philosophical world again and again and never seem to bear much fruit. Um, you know, mind-body problem, uh, free will problems and things like this. Um, how, how do you see them? Uh, simply is because we're not phrasing the questions correctly or the, or the people don't seem to have, have the same understanding of what we're actually talking about? Like because that. I have a paper on this. Yes. I submitted to all possible journalists still unpublished. <laughs> about indeterminism. There are all sorts of indeterminism, yes. You, you, you should self-publish it in this modern day. You should do it, yeah. Um, so uh, let's um, talk about history and debates about history because these seem to get going. And, of course, Popper's historicism is going to come into it. But every time you talk about history, someone's going to say something like, if the course of history had just been different, blah, 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 would happen. The Nazis would have won or whatever had have happened yeah, in the yeah, structure of yeah. this. Uh, how useful are these debates? Because I know they lead down. Sorry, to... sorry, some are, some aren't. Can you give me an example of something that you think is useful to talk about in this? But how, how about the... Um... Yes, I'll tell you. Yeah. Holocaust. The fact that Jews not involved in the Holocaust were unwilling to help the Jews in the Holocaust is dreadful, but still on the borderline of acceptance. The fact that these Jews sabotaged efforts to help European Jews is erasing. And this is something that I wrote a book about, 
and mm. which I said, I don't understand. It just makes sense to me. When you have these debates with people, do you find that they get anywhere? Because I, I think it's one no, of those... No, not only that, but they say, you are debating something uh, mm. arid because we could do nothing against the Nazis. Now, first of all, it's not true. Secondly, at least you could avoid sabotaging people who tried. What 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 do you make of um, of historicist claims? The idea is that you can predict revolutions and big changes in history. Is it worthwhile ever bothering with these arguments, or are they just um, no? They, they are not. They are not worth discussing because really historicism came as a. As a, as a result of uninteresting ideas, namely the reactionary dispositions of Hegel. Hegel said that natural sciences are rationalist and we have to concede that, we have to concede. You see, he was an irrationalist. So to admit, for him to admit that science is rational was a concession, but not the human sciences. And the human sciences he called history. And the word historicism comes from Hegel. It means you, so it means all social sciences. What about a different type of argument? So instead of saying if things had been different, the Holocaust, we, you know, perhaps the Jews could have done something about, about the Holocaust. Perhaps the argument of we can learn from history, um, as in yeah. the, the Holocaust is something you can learn from, and perhaps um, Jews today or the state of Israel can learn something from the Holocaust. Important. So yes, I agree with you. Is it not a little tenuous though to draw these lines in? In what do you mean by tenuous? Um, in the sense of they are completely disconnected moments of a kind. Of course, the hatred is still the same, but the world has dramatically changed. Our morality has dramatically changed. The politics, the, the weapons we use, so much has if changed what in the world. If it's true, then it's topic for debate. Yes. Um, the question is, do you welcome debate or do you find it uh, stressful? You see, for example, people like Carnap. Yes. Carnap was always willing to debate. He was sweet, reasonableness, but he always found debate stressful. How 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 did he function so well as a philosopher? I know I can, he, he I was in the wrong. You, I, mm. I know the answer. Twelve o'clock noon, he ceased being a philosopher. So he was self-limiting in a way. He um, said he couldn't sleep if he went on arguing. Now you enjoy debates. Do you stay up late nights after some of these debates? You're leaving Popper's house at midnight, having having a hard argument. Do you find it easy to leave it behind? Or, or is it you're up late saying, I should have said this, I should have done that? <laughs> when I say I should have made it, then I go and correct it. No, first of all, I'm easy. That is true about me in practically everything. The only thing that I really care for is the health of my family. Mm -hmm. A few questions then. Uh, how about debates in technology? You've written an entire book about technology. And exactly, because hmm. I, I tell you why. Uh, uh, everybody thinks of science and confirmation, which I think is ridiculous. There's no such thing. And they forget that in technology, confirmation is important, not only of what your claim is, but of the claim that there are no ill side effects. And that the question, what did I mean right now, is a legal question, and therefore is answered in law books and nothing less. Mm. So all philosophers, who try to answer the question, what is confirmation, are utopians. You wrote somewhere that um, a, a lot of people, um, a lot of engineers will not use the best scientific theory out there. They will use... Oh, not only that, they prefer refuted theories. Mm. There's no question about it. 
it's always easier to apply a refuted theory than an unrefuted one. Why is that? Because you don't know the, bound, from the boundaries of applicability oh. of a the theory. This is what Duhem said. Every time you extend the application of a the theory, whether we, theoretically or practically, you are making a bold step. And if you are mistaken, it's your own fault. You see, he, he was a verificationist and he recognized the refutation because he was a logician. So he said, you make an effort personally, and if you fail, it's your fault. If you succeed, it's our success. By the way, I found the same in Eddington. Eddington said, I am a realist, but it's a private belief. Also, Popper said that in Loving to the Function. What we'll changes mm -hmm. about this? In our last um, discussion, you mentioned that you 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 tried to get Popper to talk to you about morality, um, yeah. and he 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 didn't take it very well. Um, you refused, yes. Yes. So why do people find it so hard to talk about morality in as because a, I'm right and you are wrong? What and so on. But why is morality harder than other aspects of these because, things? <laughs> because people see that this is met, this matters and you can't escape from it. When they discuss theories, they make it remote. But when they discuss ethics, they find it hard to, to, to debate. And in fact, my own contribution to ethics, nobody pays attention to because of that. Is this, um, um, I, I caught a little bit of it through my readings, um, sympathy and welfare and um, and dignity. No no, red, no, no, the red line. What's the red line? In brief, sorry, Everybody yeah, I know it's a real lot. There. Everybody has a red line. If I told you I'd make you a happy man if you kill your mother, mm. at me scans. Mm. Because that's beyond the red line or beneath, as you like. And what does the red, red line add positively to morality other than a limit of which I won't be put? It says that people who are more decent have the red line nearer to where we are than others. So Everybody why, would mm. agree that under some conditions you are allowed to rob a bank. Yes. The question is, where does the line between permitting and forbidding the robbing of a, red line, of a bank lie. That's the red line. So if we're going to have a moral debate and we first discover each other's red line, this is going to be helpful. Who is nearer the truth? Mm. You see here in Israel, yes. there's no question that, for example, religious people violate religion in order to uh, approach, advance their politics. Now, their politics is religious. If it weren't religious, there was nothing to it. But the religious people, believing that they are uh, more righteous than the majority of Israelis, and they violate the law regularly. Not only the law of the land, but also the moral law. They lie, they, they are aggressive towards the Muslim neighbors and so on. You'd, I'm assuming though you'd have to show them the red line, that they wouldn't accept the red line really is where it is for them. For me. I will never try to talk with them. I would like to talk to the people in the government who support them, but not them. Why is that? I'm assuming, I mean, everybody has, uh, um, I'm assuming everyone has enough rationality to change their minds. Would they not? Yes, yes but the fact is that we Israelis don't say, what we really want. And that's very simple because we don't hate Arabs. <laughs> well, I've kept you a long time, so I might ask a couple of last questions here, um, Joseph. First of all, don't worry about me. Take your time as much as you like. You're finished and you're finished. Well, okay. I'm, I, I think it might be a, a nice way to, to talk towards the end of this about aesthetics and beauty um, and debates and those things. So. Um, this is interesting. You wrote that people have this impression that debates about aesthetics are not really debates because, you know, they don't harm one another. It's simply my choice. But this is not quite true in a certain way. 
Um, if you go back to someone like Socrates and you say the, un the unexamined life is not worth living, then we need other people. We all need dialogue. We all need criticism. So debates about aesthetics do affect other people. Is that, mm -hmm. is that close to something? Yes. See, it's very interesting. Uh, one philosopher who is puzzling is Martin Buber. Let me tell you a few things about him. Okay. He's the only philosopher I know who goes against the normal way. The normal way is for everybody to claim he is a rationalist, even if he's not. Buber is the only one who allows you to think he is irrationalist, whereas he is a rationalist proper. It's amazing. He really is a rationalist. And he criticizes the tradition of modern philosophy best I know. Descartes says, I think, therefore I exist. And Popper and Buber said, I exist because you exist. That's the best response to Descartes. Mm. And that's a quote. I exist because you exist is a quote from Buber. And Do you Buber think never mm. on that? Yeah. Do you think it's possible to be rational as an individual, or do we, or is it almost impossible? We desperately need other people around us for this project. We, we need a society. There's no question that rationality is a social entity, not a private entity. Yes. Does um does beauty exist? I mean, that that's a loaded question there. Does oh, I think it exists for sure. Yes, there's no question in my mind that it exists. Or well, argument. I, why do you think it exists? Because most people have this thing. It's it's just simply a subjective claim about the individual. It's all beauty is in the eye of the beholder kind of discussion. So that beauty is in the eye of the beholder is obviously true. The question is, yes. is that all there is to it? That is the question. Is beauty merely in the eye of the beholder is the question. Not that it is. That it is, it's obvious. That it merely is, says the positivist. So what, what is beauty? Again, another loaded question. What is beauty then? Harmony. You should ask me what is harmony and say, I don't know, but <laughs> beauty is harmony. If you don't see that the poem is uplifting, then you have no sense of poetry. By the way, Popper had no sense of poetry that I found remarkable about him. Isn't some art the opposite of harmony, as in it's completely disruptive? You know, some, oh, some alarming Gross. new installation. Yeah, Gail Gross is an example. You know Gail Gross? I do not know. 1900s, Germany. He is a cartoonist, painter, whatever it is. You might like to look at him. He is ugly. By the way, one may say that even... Uh, There is a Caravaggio, which is intentionally mm -hmm. ugly and so on. So I don't know. There, there, there may be, I think of Dostoevsky that way. There's no question that Dostoevsky had pieces that he intended to be ugly. Ugly or, or, or psychologically challenging? Mm -hmm. Or the same it thing? Like, it <laughs> like, I don't know. It doesn't matter. What but he, in mm. the brothers Karamazov, one of the brothers is purely good and one is purely evil, yes. What do you make of modern art individually? How, how, how do you find it? A lot of people always point to modern art as a complete failure of the attachment the of beauty to art. art. The first modern artist is Malevich. And I'm co-author of a book on Malevich. So is modern art a, a, a form of beauty then? And most people will say yes, it's not art at all. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a diversion from it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's what Freud said. I think it's ridiculous. Mm. Modern art is modern art. So what is it in modern art? Is it a type of scarcity that it's being displayed, something rare or something that you haven't thought of or something different that is, that is coming to the fore? See, um, many people would say that paintings like those of Mondrian are very easy to emulate. And Somerset Mon, who was an art critic first rate, said, you only think so, try it and see if you can. 
think this is a wonderful observation. He says, it looks like child's play to emulate him. Go on, try. <laughs> is beauty um, a good guide for science and for art, in a sense, if you want it's to do only, some? It, it's only a, a, a heuristic value. People say, look, Schrodinger didn't want to give up his equation because it looked too beautiful. It's well known. And people say, you see, here aesthetic appears as a value. No, it's only as heuristic value. Is, is one of the problems in this that within the art world, they haven't embraced debate and argument as they should, that they're not really sympathizing with the other this person. Is true even of science. Science, which is the peak of rationality, suffers from hostility to debate. See, I'm a physicist, so I can report to you from inside. I, I, I bought your book, uh, um, History of Physics. It's, ah, I'm reading through it now. I'm, I, I'm about halfway through, so I'll, 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 I'll you let you like know. It halfway through? Yeah. It's, it's, I'm, enjoying like it it. I'm enjoying the, the Socratic back and forth. Yeah. I, it's I think a book it, written in one day. You really? No, I'm lying to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's 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 good fun, and um, it, it's a great way to open up science. It's the book of mine that won most hostility. Now I can't imagine why that would be. Why is that? Yes, yes, of course. Plato says you can't be a philosopher if you don't suffer from it. Did you know that? I, I, I do have a vague re recollection of reading something like that back in my undergraduate Talmudic, days. Talmudic scholars say you are not a Talmudic scholar unless you are suffering and you are suffering poverty too and so on. Some people are misanthropes, some people are Puritans. I don't know. I don't know what to do about these things. Do you enjoy the suffering or is it... Um... <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, no, I mean, um, there is great value to be found in suffering sometimes, isn't there? I mean, you know, people go back and read people like Nietzsche and they get a lot of motivation and they can reinterpret the suffering in their life in positive ways. No, no, I, I value Nietzsche for some things, for his truthfulness, for his bringing philosophy down to earth and so on. Nietzsche has a, a, a lot of assets, but... When I read Zarathustra, beginning of book two, I was disgusted. Yeah. No, I find he has disgusting things. Also, he, he, he was not consistent. He didn't care for consistency. He contradicted himself on almost all things. Only one thing he was consistent about is anti-feminism. Yes. <laughs> that was the only thing he was consistent about all the way. But otherwise, he contradicted himself without any any effort. If and science, that is mm. best, no, please, yeah. His best book is Gay Science, which is about his own science. It's one of his so, earlier books, yes. No, I think it is mm. best. Mm. If the joy of science is to me very important. How does one? I was, I was just going to say that. I mean, that book that I, I have across next to me now is, is a lot of that. I believe you're talking to your son and having discussions with him. And with, it's, not to, with. With, sorry. Um, and it's, it's, it's wonderful. And it, it's, it's that attempt to bring life to science. So how is, it, yeah. how is it possible to bring joy to science? Most people say that this, this is something that's not going to happen or most people um, struggle through it. Or as you say, most scientists are not great with criticism and debate. Let, let me tell you a story. Uh, the book begins with Copernicus. Yes. Uh, we wanted the book at a certain time to enter some famous series, and the editor of the series sent it to a very famous editor in New York, perhaps the best in New York. And that editor changed the order from Copernicus to Stylus because he knew that Stylus came first. And I stopped the whole process at once. I started with Copernicus because my kid eight-year-old knew about Copernicus, but he didn't know about Thales. Mm. But the editor didn't think much in this way. What is important about this book is that it 
never forgets the reader. On a, a last point about beauty, how much of it is wrapped up in intricate patterns and um, the, um, the trained art? Because most people, uh, that, as, as you said, beauty is this, uh, this claim beauty is in the eye of the holder is, 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 I, I is not true. In the book on aesthetics that I wrote with Javi, we say one thing which I think is, is a humdinger. It said any criterion of beauty that you care to present, you'll find somebody who takes it as a challenge. That I think is very nice. Mm. Well, a couple of last questions then. Agreement. Um, um, how closely do you um, see agreement as as tied to conformity in a way? Because when we all agree on something, there's no progress I, to happen. I told you people value agreement because they think that disagreement is strife. Once you realize that disagreement can be fun, this is lost. So how do we make people disagree more and seek disagreements in the world? Because um, it is vitally important for you know the species. I mean, I don't want to overstate only things. One formula. I have only one formula. Never believe your teacher. And what does that do to? I mean, I, I can start imagining it, but I'd rather ask you: What does that do to the individual when you when you encourage them to disbelieve their teachers? What does that? I don't know, but I know one thing: that everyone will read it differently. And then diversity comes in criticism. See, I value diversity because I don't value agreement. It's really the two sides of the same coin. Yes. See, when I was young, I was extremely eager to be heard. Never mind what for or about what. Now I don't care about it, but at the time I really was hungry to be heard. And I said such funny things as according to Galileo, the earth is flat. And this sounds crazy because Galileo knew that the earth is round. There's no question about it. And nobody asked me, why do you say this weird thing? The first thing who asked, the first man who asked me this question was Popper. And the answer is, I, I'm guessing it, it's, it, you, got, you got a certain amount of recognition that didn't happen beforehand when you say no, these things. No, because when you study falling bodies, the center of the earth is infinitely distant. Any piece of a circle, if it's small enough, mm. it's almost a straight line. That's the answer. So what shook you from, from this? Hmm? What shook you from this? I'm, 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 I, I have to assume Pop Popper didn't take this very well. No, he took it very well. He took it nicely. He agreed with me at once. What was missing in Popper's Logic the Fortune, which is a magnificent book, mm. is approximationism. Einstein took approximationism as the most basic quality of science. Every theory is approximation to its follower. According to Einstein, Newton is almost right. Yeah. That's approximationism. All his life, Einstein put every theory as approximate to its, its earlier one. And this is um, why it's important to salvage uh, verisimilitude, sorry. Exactly so, yes. You are very good. <laughs> um, last question then. Um, how do, I'm, I'm assuming towards the end of, of one of your articles that I read recently, actually maybe in one of your books, you write, it is important to start by asking ourselves, what would change my mind? That kind of pop airing question. And, um, so what 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 does this do? Yeah. What does this do psychologically for the person? I, I know, of course, it makes the you know a category for refutation. But what does it do psychologically for the individual themselves? When I'll they answer say, you. Mm. You see, Popper asked this question in his seminar always, and I found it a marvelous question. And Popper's response to the response I found intolerable, because if you say nothing will make me change my mind, then I would say. 
fine, let's have a cup of coffee. And Popo would blow all his steam when he had such an answer. It's very interesting. Popper was a hypochondriac. And he went from one doctor to another. And as you know, doctors are absolutely self-assured. And he would teach them philosophy. And it was terrible. Uh, once in Christmas, he had his retina fall. And you know, if you don't fix the retina at once, you become blind. Mm. And it was Christmas Eve, and he couldn't find a doctor. And I found him a doctor. And I said to the doctor, please do me a favor with these patients, don't hide your doubts, on the contrary, exaggerate them. And he did, and they became friends at once. And then the doctor looked at me and said, you are not his doctor, are you? And I laughed and I said, no, I'm just his doctor. So the doctor changed his mind and at once they fell apart. Mm. You know the funny story? Yes. <laughs> so part of the, um. Part of um, asking yourself that question, what would prove me wrong, is not just to find that criteria, but also to shake up the no, inner dogmatist in us as well. No, just to continue, to know how to continue the conversation. See, if you really want to be effective, you ask a question that leads somewhere. And when I ask you what would make you change your mind and you say nothing, then my answer is let's have a cup of coffee. Yes. I'm not joking. That's the right response. Mm. And Popo would not think. Popo would say, do you think you are God or something like that? Which is silly in his, on his part. So you, your response seems to me more appro appropriate in the sense of um, they may not know what would prove them wrong. And, you know, they may... No, I respect, I respect yes. the answer. I don't analyze it. But something eventually has the capacity to prove them wrong in the sense that they're rational people. Quite so, they just they just don't they know what it nothing, is. When they say nothing, then the only response is let's have coffee. Mm. I'm not joking. That's how I do it. So as a very last question here, and I'm just leading from that, there's a time and a place to walk away from debate then and from criticism and from argument when it's it really is not um, productive. When I argue with somebody and I see that he has to be right at all costs, I, I desist. I remember once I was invited to talk to Kuhn's seminar, Tom Kuhn. And uh, Hempel came to the seminar, not for any other reason than out of courtesy. We were friends, so he came. And he came with his entourage. And amongst Antoine, there was a fellow who was a student, but now he's a very famous man, who says, wait a minute, I, I, I'm a bit disturbed. So I said, everybody stop, let him talk. And I asked him, what bothers you? He said, do you mean to say that there are people with whom you disagree, but you appreciate what they say? And I said, are you alluding to my attitude to Kuhn? So everybody was laughing. And he got angry and he said, I mean it seriously, please. So I said, wait a minute, do you appreciate Hume? I said, of course. Do you appreciate Kant? Of course. And you know where I was reading. I was trying to show him that he cannot agree with both because Kant is opposite to Hume. He said so openly and so on. And the fellow started losing his mind. And I eased off. I wasn't going to take care for his mental breakdown. How does it feel to walk, and last question, I promise. How does it feel to walk away from that debate? Because even though he is being completely unreasonable, it, it, it can't be satisfying to leave in the sense of you've just encountered someone who you've realized, I can't debate, change their mind. It's own limits. Mm. That you can't insist on debate under all conditions. That I learned from Popper's mistake. That, also, uh, for example, in the military, you cannot argue with your boss. Mm. That might actually be a good mo a good uh, place to end our discussion about debate on that moment of uh, there's a place for and a place not. Um, 
I hope it's to your liking. I always enjoy it, Joseph, and um, it's so much fun. I I will do my very best to link all the articles that I've read, um, at least all these spoken about today below the podcast, as well as uh, two books which I read for this. And hopefully, perhaps in the future, we can chat again about your book about the history of physics once, once I've finished great, it. It's a great pleasure to hear you comment on papers of mine that nobody has commented on thus far. So I thank you so much too. Well, that's my pleasure as well. So, uh, again, thanks again. And um, I will put all the links below. Uh, Joseph Agassi, thank you so much for your time again. You're welcome. Thank you for having me.